Well, hello and welcome to this webinar. My name is Sharon Mark Taggart, and along with Dr. Sally Cathcart, we are the co-founders and directors of The Curious Piano Teachers. And it is our absolute pleasure to have Leah Vies from 88 uh, Piano Keys um, with us on the call today, where she's gonna be talking about making connections. Uh, begins with the end. I love the curious title. So mm. Sally and Leela, how are you both doing today? Pretty good. Hi. Yeah, Leela, over to you first. I, it's early morning here in the States and I'm awake and I have my coffee. So I'd have to say I'm pretty well. Yeah, <laughs> we're, yeah we're, 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 we're 7 a.m. Yeah, with you, 2 p.m. here. <laughs> Um, so welcome everybody. We'd love to know whereabouts you are in the world. You are watching us and joining us from. So you've all got some chat, a chat box. You should find a chat box. Um, and then, oh, now maybe we're here, we're finding out that we can't um, all chat to each other because Hannah's just said that you can't change it to all panellists. So I tell you what, Sharon, if you I've just, to I've just done that and I wonder whether or not it might work now. Sharon? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, okay. Can I leave you in charge for a second while I go off and uh, see if I can change it? You can yeah, call yeah, yeah. that people. For sure. Yeah? Okay. okay. So right. in the meantime, yeah, just keep the chat coming in. I'm going to say a quick hello to um people who are joining us i can see we have duan from lisbon in northern ireland you're just down the road from me duan hello um want to say hello to diana uh in tennessee i'm guessing leela is that kind of around kind of 6 a.m or something or no it wouldn't be as early as that what 8 a.m Correct. Uh, maybe eight or nine, depending on what part of the East Coast that's on. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us uh, so early this morning. Hello to Debbie, uh, who's listening in from, from Southampton. I uh, want to say hello to Felicity um, in Berkshire. Uh, Jane in north of Scotland, Wendy saying hello from Nottingham. We have Angie from Reading. We have Grace um, from Brunei. Wonderful, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have Natalia from Surrey, we have Rachel from Milton Keynes, Nina from London, Sarah in Cork, uh, Diana, yeah, it's 9 a.m. in Tennessee. Wonderful. Uh, Catherine in sunny Hebden Bridge, uh, saying hello to Maggie, who is in Yorkshire. Um, Annette in Cornwall. Uh, Marie in sunny St. Laird's. Yeah, the sun seems to be out in the UK today. Um, okay, and so many more people hopping in. Just want to say a massive, massive welcome. It's lovely that so um, everyone is spread right across and it is really our pleasure to have you on the call today. Now, uh, just as we're waiting for Sally to come back in again, I am just going to share my screen um, and just tell everyone a little bit more about uh, the Curious Piano Teachers. So just bear with me, I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, at the Curious Piano Teachers we have an online membership site. Uh, Sally and I have been doing this since 2015 and so every single month our members get access to a what we call a curiosity box um, and you can see here these are the boxes um, that date right the whole way back to May 2015 and I just want to say that if you are not yet a member of the community we have um, a coupon code just called free support. If you go across to our website, you can add that in at the checkout. You get uh, a free month just to hop in there and explore. There is lots and lots there. So that's all I'm going to say. I'll put a link in the comments in just a minute and you can explore that in your own time. Sally, you're back. Yes, I am back. And I think it, the, the problem is, is our end completely why you can only chat to all panellists. And I think what, um, my fault, because I've been playing around with the settings, um, 
So, um, and I don't think we can change them midway. So rest assured, we can see your chat. So please, if you've got questions, do, do um, put them into the chat. Um, but I'm really sorry, because you can't, I know you all love to chat to each other as, as we go on with this and share your ideas, but do share your ideas, because what we can do is we can save the chat afterwards and then we can distribute it and anything that we don't manage to um, mention, but we will mention as much as we can, I promise you. Yeah. So my fault completely. I'm no, sorry. that's fine. And what I will also <laughs> say is that we will be sending uh, everyone who has registered for this webinar, um, if you log out and in your inbox later, we will be sending you an email with the replay. So I think probably without further ado, um, we want to hand over to, to Leela. Uh, we've had a quick sneak peek at, at the slides and this is going to be really exciting. So Leela, over to you. And again, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Sharon. It's great to be here. I share my slides. I just want to know, raise your hand and you can put it in the comment in the chat section if you are a control freak. None of you are? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say. I am a very, I know myself well, and I would love to have full control about pretty much everything. And so this theme that Sally contacted me about, this making connections theme, was part of a bigger theme about me trying to find control when life has handed us a whole bunch of things that are now out of our control. And one of the things that we do have control in uh, and of is in our lessons and what happens in our lessons. And one of the things that I highlighted was making connections. And so what I'm gonna show you in my slides are going to highlight seven different ways that we can make connections with our students. How we relate to our students, how we pace our lessons, how we advise practice, how we explain any concept and how we connect the dots within a lesson and how we streamline our plans with a theme and how we relinquish control of our agendas. So without further ado, I'm going to share my slides here and I'll just make sure that you can see those before I begin. So Sally, can you see the slides all right? Yep, that's lovely, Lynn. Thank you. Okay, so making connection begins with the end. So let me describe to you what I mean by that. And let's just start with how we relate to students in our lessons. And I've got three different ways for you to think about relating to your students in your lesson, especially when you are online. It's really hard to make that one on one connection. It can just be a little bit more awkward. So before I started my lessons again this fall, which by the way, I'm in a hybrid situation. I teach some in person and some online. So I'm doing a little bit of both. So I did get, you know, I've been in the trenches in that online only uh, adventure and it's not always been easy. But I, as I started out this new session, I wanted to make sure my students came prepared because we all know how frustrating it is when students arrive and they didn't bring this book and what, you don't have this. So that's why I made the checklist. So then you can set up your students for success from the start. And then having some kind of opener for a lesson can really help you connect with students. And there is a person named David Stewart who is an educational specialist here in the States. And he calls these moments of trying to connect with a student, moments of genuine connection or MGCs. And I liked that idea. And he said they don't have to take very long, but it's just a way for you, you to connect with a student and engage in a conversation about what their life may be. Especially if they're quiet, it's kind of hard to know what to do to trigger that conversation. And so what I decided to do is I wanted students to share a photo of a favorite summer adventure that they had or a favorite memory and then and then this was they I kind of uh, went mm, I kind of broke one of my rules here because I asked them to create a piece that might sound like that favorite memory and the reason why it broke a rule is because 
I didn't give them any boundaries. And usually when I ask students to create, I want to give them clear boundaries because otherwise they have this sense of overwhelm. But I was amazed with how, with number one, the, the pictures that students brought in and shared, and secondly, the music that they came up with. And there's a whole reason behind that that I won't go into why I felt like they were equipped to create a piece. But regardless, even the picture itself was just a fun way for me to connect with them and find out what their summer was like despite a pandemic. And it was a neat way to connect. And then you, uh, to establish a good relationship, it's also interesting to find out why students are sitting on your bench. Now, it could be because parents want them there, but I think it's interesting to ask them what their goals may be for the time that they're spending with you. And so I asked all of my students to name three goals. And some of them were quite lofty, like I am gonna create uh, three new pieces. And th these were some of my older students and some of them really didn't know what they wanted to do, but yeah, I wanna learn a Halloween piece, you know? And, and all of those kind of things really help me prepare them for what they want to do. And so I think it's a, a neat way for, the, for you to get to know them just a little bit more. All right, then the second way that we can make connections with our students is with pacing our lessons with them in mind. And, I, and really what we want to do is think about how we are, con how we want our students to leave at, when they're finished with a lesson. We have to begin with the end. And so here's three ways to be thinking about it. We have to focus on that finish. When they walk out the door, we have to make sure that they're prepared for what we want them to accomplish. So number one, our instruction has to be neat and tidy. We have to limit how much we are talking and uh, we have to keep our eyes on the clock and on our tongue. If like, I feel like these webinars, we talk far too much right? Because we keep talking. We're not engaging in a conversation. I feel like a lesson is all about a conversation. In fact, I just read a really good quote about, you know, taking a lesson. What does that mean? We're taking a punishment? No, no, no. We're engaging in the lesson. So keeping our instruction full of engaging type of conversation and dialogue is, is key to making connections with your students. And then another important thing is to set limits, assign bite-sized tasks. I think we feel pressure as teachers, like, oh, this teacher's doing this, this teacher's doing that, we have to do all of these things. We don't have to do all of them right away. And we're going to overwhelm our students if we say, okay, learn this piece by next time. We have to chop things up into small bite-sized tasks, and that will help them a lot with what they can accomplish. We want them to meet goals. We don't want them to set goals and not meet them. Then they're always going to feel like they're failing. We want to set them up for success. And then keep it short. Use concise and concise instructions. So what I mean by that is I, I love little tabs like this. They come in all sizes and colors and all that kind of stuff. But right now, I, like I said, I'm teaching in a hybrid situation. So I'm at one piano, I've got a sneeze guard, and then I've got a piano over there. So usually I would do this for students, and now they're having to do that themselves. They each have their own little packet of tools at the lesson. And now I ask them to put these in their music and use them as stop signs. And so I will write in their lesson notes, okay, you're gonna work hands alone and hands together up to the stop sign. And right away that gives them, okay, yes, I can do this. And then of course we talk about what is uh, happening in those lines up to the stop sign so that they know exactly how to approach them in their practice. And I will talk a little bit more about that. But I, I don't think you can do any harm by breaking things up into smaller pieces and making it very clear where the finish line is for your students. So that's the second thing, pacing your lessons. Then the next thing is, like I said, practice. I'm going to dive into practice just a little bit more. And I want you to think about three different things when it comes to practice. First of all, you need to practice, practice in your lessons. I think sometimes teachers are, are disappointed in their students because they're not practicing or they're not practicing the way that we'd hope so that it makes progress between lessons. And it really comes back to us. It comes back to what we are doing in a lesson. Are we 
teaching our students how to practice. And I am talking about all age levels. I have adult piano students who do not know how to practice. They were never taught that skill. They were not in a profession that had to practice something as, as difficult as, as learning the piano or a musical instrument. And so we need to help them establish habits. And I'm a big fan of the author James Clear who wrote the book Atomic Habits. And he says there are four laws to establishing ha a habit. And really, a habit is changing a behavior. Your students did not know how to practice and they didn't know that they were going to have to make a new habit. And so we have to help them move into behavior. And the four ways to do that is we have to make it obvious to our student why practice is important. And that's pretty obvious when you're learning a new instrument. You have to practice. You have to repeat something in order to get better at it. And then it has to be easy. That's why you want bite-sized uh, assignments that you stop signs so that, yes, the student like, yeah, this is easy. In fact, I almost like to do, I almost like to see my students roll their eyes like, of course I can do that. You know, that's not hard. I can do that. That's what you want them to feel right away. And then it has to be attractive. It has to be fun. And, and that's where we like to be engaging. We like to be fun teachers. And I think, you know, you're here because you want that for your students. And then the last thing to help students establish a habit is the habit that they are working on has to be satisfying. And that's when it comes to the repertoire that they're playing and that, that, they, that they can see that they're making progress at the repertoire and at those goals that they set. That's what we're helping them do. Okay, and then the very important thing about practicing is slicing it up. There is a study that says that people are more like, are 70% more likely to eat an apple if it's sliced up for them. <laughs> so I think that's a really important fact that we can take back to our lessons. We have to give digestible assignments. They have to be easy to swallow. If, if we give them this whole apple and man, you know, if they've got braces on, it's really hard to bite into that apple, right? We have to make it friendly for them so that, yes, I can do this. Uh, it, that often lets them fall, if it's too big of a task, they fall into something called approach avoidance. I love that term. And what that means is that, okay, it's just, it's overwhelming. I can't go there. I'm not going to do it. And, and we've all felt that in some ways. You know, if we got to clean the whole house or we've got to organize something that's just, it's too big, we just walk away from it. Go get lunch instead. <laughs> and then the, the next thing about practice is that let your students uh, decide what they're going to accomplish between lessons. I feel like, you know, we've got our agenda, this needs to be done, all that kind of stuff, but let them help you set those goals because we don't know what their life is like. Perhaps they just can't manage that much practice in a day, but you want to help them to practice daily. Help them figure out where they're going to fit in practice and let them decide together. And they're going to take ownership then in their practice when you allow them to contribute to what they're going to do between lessons. So then the next one I'll move on to is concrete tools. And the, the basic thing about concrete tools is that science has shown that when your students have things that they can touch, tactile tools, it will make connections with them. It will help them remember things. So I want to give some examples of that in just a minute. So uh, my play on words, you want to cement a system for your students. So when you say practice, they're going to be thinking about different ways that they can practice. Uh, a good friend of mine has said, you need a handle in order to grasp something. And I'm like, oh yeah, just like a pot, right? You need a handle to grab it. So same thing with practice tools. You need a name and concrete tools for your students to really grab onto what you mean by that. So here are some different ways that you can help your students cement a system in their practice. And the reason why I say system is going back to James Clear, he's the one who talks about habits. He said, you know, habits are great. But more importantly, you need a system with your habits. So, you know, if we brush our teeth every morning, that's great. But we need to have a system to our brushing our teeth. You know, if we only top, uh, if we only brush the top of our teeth, right? 
uh, and not the bottom, we are not really creating a solid system and we might get cavities on our back molars if we don't brush all our teeth. So you want to make sure that you have a good system in place for your students. And here's some ideas. You can do the link and chain practice where you play one measure, play another, and then put them together. So especially for the students that are online, teachers that are online, you need kind of jumbo things. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but I've got big jumbo paper clips right here. So I may have my students say, okay, or I'll say to my students, can you play measure one? Just measure one. That's it. And then, oh, you just earned your first paper clip. And then I'll say, ooh, can you now play measure two? And remember, this is probably going to be a piece that's a little bit harder. And so they may have to do it a couple of times until, yes, they got it. And you want to make sure that they know that they have it, right? And so it's not just you saying, oh, yes, that's it. But you want to ask, well, how did you do? Did it sound good? No, I think I got to do it again. So let them do both measures by themselves until they've got them. And then say, okay, now play those two together. And once they can play those two together and make it flow, then they get to link the paper clips together. And this is a nice concrete way for them to see that they're making progress and then they can keep adding. So go to your favorite office supply store and start finding some big jumbo paper clips. They're so much fun. Now, another way I like to do this is to use backwards practice. And I'm not talking about playing the whole piece backwards. I'm talking about isolating the last measure and using a post-it note to cover up everything except that last measure. Kind of like a surgeon. When they perform a surgery, they cover up everything except where they're going to, um, to uh, like operate on that patient. So same thing. Cover up that last measure. Play the last measure. Ooh, you got that right now uncover measures the last two measures and play those it's a very satisfying way to practice and science has shown that it also is is very good for a student because it becomes easy by the end they have to work really hard because they're working on a new measure and then that old that last measure becomes like an old friend it becomes familiar and they're not as fatigued because they worked hard at the beginning and now it's getting easier at the end and then last thing, the dice decides. Now, if you've got some jumbo dice at home, that's a great way uh, to engage your students in practice, especially online. So you could roll the dice, you land on number five. Now, before you do this, let me back up and say, ask your students if they're working on a whole piece. They've got the whole piece learned, but they now they need to master it or memorize it. Break it up into six different uh, sections because there's six numbers on a dice here and then you can roll the dice oh it lands on three and ask your student to begin at section three of that piece play to the end and then start at the beginning and then end at section three so it just tosses everything around and studies has, have also shown that that's very good for their brains to mess the order of things up just a little bit in their practice so those are the first four Let's see. Yes, because we talked about cementing a system. Yes, I think that's it for the first four. So, Sally, we had talked yeah, about yeah. stopping here just for a second so that <laughs> you girl can chime in and add your two cents. Oh, I was writing, scribbling down all those <laughs> wonderful ideas going on, Lila, and I've got so much oh, to say. Um, I mean, I. I love that idea of your checklist, just going back to that first one and the connection. Um, and actually it was that that I saw that made me think, oh yeah, good one. And I, I did the same, I put together a, a keyboard kickoff for the beginning of my, my year, yeah? So a week before I started teaching, which is this week, um, the week last week, I put together this keyboard kickoff with a, a whole set of six day challenges. And one of them was to share the photo. Of the of something they did over the summer, and it really was lovely to see them share. And a couple of them also improvised some pieces. And they, you know, there's one boy in particular who loves improvisation. In fact, he would improvise all day long, and not not read a single note if I let him. You know, so to him, this was the best thing ever that he could just sit there and improvise. So, I, I think that is so important. These these moments of genuine connection going on. So thank you for those ideas. Mm -hmm. Sharon. Wonderful. Yeah, I just want to say a big thank you, Leela, as well. Um, I mean, you were talking earlier on right at the beginning about 
how it's so easy for us as teachers to talk way, way too much. And um, I know that we, we talk about something called the advice monster and how, you know, actually we need to sit back every so often because otherwise the advice monster gets in the way. Um, and of, of course there is that thing of where students are, um, it's all about helping them to be independent because, you know, typically if it's a 30 minute lesson, there's 10,050 minutes before we see them again the following week. So it is so important that they get all of these little things. I mean, I loved the love, the tactileness, because I find that students always respond so well. You know, we can tell them about, you know, the concept, but if they've got paper clips, if they have got the dice, I mean, that's another, I mean, I love that idea. So, so they're not starting, kickstarting at bar one every time, because then what happens in the next lesson is, yeah, they can play the first eight bars fantastically, but you know, what happens when they come to the B section? What happens when they come to the coda? It's like they never get there. So I love those practical ideas. I really yeah. do. And, and, and the stop sign as well. I mean, as part of my keyboard kickoff, once, once everybody's completed it, they'll all get it, they're all getting a little kind of bonus bag. And I've put a piece of music in there and I've got a pencil. I've been clearing out underneath my piano, which is just this treasure trove of stuff I've collected. And I thought, I'm just going to pass this all on, you know, and they're so excited because I haven't told them what's in it. And, and they do have these little stickers as well. So that's a perfect use for them. So yeah. very excited about that. Um, and, and the choice so, as well. Love that choice, you mentioned yeah. choice. You know, it's almost like um, an analogy, you know, like you kind of walk into a sweet shop and the child, you know, the adult goes over and goes, okay, so you're going to have this and this. I mean, like how horrible and how boring. <laughs> so yeah, mm. it's so important because otherwise we can, I mean, even interesting, um, you know, what we've been talking about, about how sometimes us going online can take away, certainly for those of us who are still teaching online, it can, we can lose a certain amount of control. I think, you know, why so many of us were nervous at the beginning was the fact that the kind of the control that we normally would have in a setting, you know, where we're so afraid and so used to, I take that away, um, we can feel uncomfortable. But of course, we've got to remember that sometimes what we feel comfortable with is actually, you know, it's not as nice for the students. So, yeah, I love that reminder about how important it is for us to give up some of that power, as it were, and kind of go, okay, so what do you like? What's important to you? Because it just, the relationship with students can change so dramatically when they realize, oh, I'm actually, I have a say. I have a say in what I do in, 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 my, in my piano lessons. At the end of the day, <laughs> it's their lesson. <laughs> so, yeah, big thank you for that reminder. So good. Um, just a, a, a few comments that have, that have come in. Um, uh, Nadia is saying, this is great. I'm really enjoying it. Just what I was hoping for and would normally be smiling at us in a room. Um, so sending a virtual <laughs> smile, she says. Um, uh, Aniko is, is, is um, supporting the Atomic Habits book. She says a great book, not only for students, but for teachers. And as well as it really teaches us how to integrate and develop healthy and effective habits. Um, and um, Maggie says she really likes backwards practice um, because the section they're playing always finishes at the end. So it always has a neat finishing point, yeah. And they can't be tempted to go on further and it will sound good to stop there, yeah. And then Adrian's put a slightly cryptic question, which I'm not sure what, what, what he's asking. He says, notes behind the speaker. So, <laughs> ah. let's, let us, let us know what you mean. <laughs> oh, I think she's, I see what he means, yes. She's coming, she's coming to that in a minute, Adrian. okay. So, <laughs> I think, should we just get on with the notes? You guys are speaker? all so curious. <laughs> <laughs> Back over to you, Leela. Well, I don't know, maybe I will. <laughs> no, I'm, yes. I'm getting to some good things, I promise. Well, I'm glad to hear that this is connecting with all of you. I, it, it really does make a difference. And what's really interesting is that my students self-diagnose their practice needs all the time now. 
it, my older ones, I'll say, like, well, how, how do you think you need to practice it this week? I'm like, I need link and chain practice. Like, okay, that's what you're doing. And, and then leading to, you know, them deciding what they want to do. I've had student, I had one student, because I went online, she was in college, she started taking lessons again. And, and again, she's driving the show. She wants to compose, she wants to do her own thing. And it's because I've had that relationship with her for so long that, and because I went online, then she had access to lessons yet again. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's so many neat things, despite all of the horrible things, Absolutely. you know, a lot of good things with this as well. Absolutely. And I love the fact that we, you know, there are so many different, um, uh, ways that we can refer to these practice tools i mean we we have a, a curiosity box where we have a suite of practice tools mm -hmm. and um link and chain we call plus one it's oh. plus one practice yeah um and you know they're all interchangeable and, and you know i like to say as long as we're persistent and consistent with the terms we use you know rather than change we also my, my kids are very fond of the magic number three which means you repeat something three times. What kind of practice should I should you do there? Magic number three practice. So <laughs> their favorite one. I mean, I think I'm gonna steal that from you because it is all about lingo, right? Just having a cute little way to say it. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'll say, well, how many times are you gonna practice that? And then I'll say two times. I'm like, you know, I just don't like two. I like three so much better. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was taking an exercise class recently and I love the way they said it. First you learn it then you practice it and then you crush it <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah. you know use that same yeah. thing with your students yeah. you can crush it the third time yeah. right yeah yeah it could be you know and i'd also do do things like um fabulous five practice oh, yeah. sometimes and, and super seven practice you know super seven practice is a crushing it kind of practice really isn't it well, then I'll also do something else too, where I'll say three times or else. And, and what that means yeah. is by the third time it has to be, no, I call it third time perfect, I think is what it is. So they play it three times. And the problem is the third time you get a little cocky, like I got this. And then that's a mistake. So then like if the third time you mess up, you got to start all over and do it again. And yeah. you know, that's, yeah. that's yeah. terrorizing to some, but some of them love that. And they absolutely really put that pressure on. And and using little practice buddies, little little erasers. I mean, especially with the younger kids. I mean, they just absolutely get that. So I have my little three practice buddies or my three ducks and they get to move the duck over only if they play it the right way though. Well, thank you. Cause that reminds me now of, I. I have one called three penny practice. So I, you can use pennies, you can use ducks, you can use Skittles, you know, during, during Halloween time, they can use their candy, whatever. But I had all these practice strategies and I was getting tired of writing them out on little post-its. And so I recently made little digital stickers so I can send the digital stickers in to NARA, which that's the system that I use to share yeah. assignments. So I can send them digitally, but I also got them printed off on little oh, post-its. I kind of went crazy. I got get under the hood. I got, oh, drive by practice, which means play it, go away, come back, that kind of stuff. And then the around the world practice. I, so yeah, I, I have all those stickers, which I can share a link to. Uh, so you can do whatever you want with them, but I've been having fun with those. All right, so back to my slides. So okay. I will share my screen again here. All right, so we just finished off with cementing a system. So I'm going to go to the next, the next way we can relate to our students and make connections is by connecting the dots. Now, you probably have heard of simultaneous learning made uh, uh, known by Paul Harris. And it really, it's the two for one that you want to find in your lessons. So as far as technique, you can have a student play a scale and really scales always bored me and I did not have a really strong background in scales and then I started working with my colleague Bradley Sowash and he made scales so much more fun because he wants his students to be able to play in just half notes I don't know if you can hear that or not but just half notes with a nice steady beat and then one octave in half notes two octaves in quarter notes then three octaves in quarter note triplets, then 
uh, let's see, then two octaves in eighth notes, three octaves in eighth note triplets, and then four octaves in sixteenth notes, all keeping the metronome at the same speed. So you're really locking in your your ability to play scales and also to play them quickly, but also you are measuring how well you're doing at all those different tempos, but still staying within that that metronome or even better yet tying it into some kind of groove I have a clavinova and I'll show what I do with that in just a minute but letting students play their technique with a groove they're help it's helping them establish um, a rhythm an internal pulse and it's also giving them information about how their fingers need to play you can talk about posture you can talk about hand position fingering all that kind of stuff and then you can also um, talk about theory. So that's why technique can really add so many things all in one little ball. And now speaking of theory, and I think I mentioned I have one of my little post-its here, is getting under the hood. I think it's really easy to have our students to play a piece, but get under the hood with them. You know, like, what did this composer do here? I was just working with a student who's working on a sonata, and she has the exposition learned, and then she went through the development, and then we're going into the recapitulation. Now, the recapitulation looks a lot like the exposition. So we had to discover what's the difference. Now, really, an exposition is exposing all the themes, but then taking a trip over to the dominant, going to the five chord usually. And then the development is like heading off to Europe and stopping at all these cool places, but then coming back home to that exposition, I'm sorry, to the recapitulation. And then the recapitulation is very much the same as the exposition, but it's not going on its trip. It's going back home to that home tone. So that's why things are going to change. But when you get under the hood, it helps your students understand what the composer is doing, and it's going to help them uh, it's going to help them memorize, it's going to help them interpret because they're seeing what the composer is actually doing. So I, I think that's really important when, when you learn uh, when you learn uh, the repertoire with your students. You know, see what these composers are doing and that's going to make them want to get creative. So that's where I'm going to go to next is creativity. And like I said at the beginning, I didn't like it. I did not like giving that assignment to my students about play what this piece sounds like or what this picture sounds like what this memory feels like the reason why i don't like to give those is because some of them freeze some of them don't like to do any anything close to that where others like sally's student oh they could go on forever and i did i had some students that wow <laughs> i kind of had a set of time limit but Others really don't know how to do that or they don't feel comfortable with that. But I do want everyone to learn how to be creative and find their own voice, even if it's just in little snippets. So here's a way then for you to help your students build their own creativity. So if they're working on this, okay, pretty common musette. Now one way you could have them change it is to, something that simple but I like to give them examples of like let's think of ways that we could change this up and make it your own and they may not have them right away so then you just keep giving them new ideas oh let's see what if I did I'm blocking my uh, left hand something a little bit different or Suddenly, it, it, well, it kind of sounds like music, but not like it was before. So those are gr great, what, jumping off points for your students. And uh, they're learning a, a piece, but then they're also learning how to find their own creative voice. And that it doesn't have to be really difficult in order to be a lot of fun. All right. And then the very next thing is, oh, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Because I was going to show an example of... Uh, I'm going to stop here just a minute and I'm going to just go back to myself so that you can see me just a little bit better, better because I want to talk about how I am connecting the dots with students with literally talking about dotted notes. And getting under the hood of rhythm is tricky sometimes. And sometimes I really like to narrow the scope and just talk about one little tiny thing and use that as a lesson opener. So this is what I'm doing with my students right now. 
uh, this week. We are talking about dotted notes. Recently, someone just shed this, uh, maybe you all know, knew this already, but wow, it really rocked my world about dotted notes. So I wanna share it with you, and I'm, I'm gonna show you exactly how I'm doing this with my students. And you can do this with students online or in person, either one, because I've tried it with both and it works. So first of all, uh, let me see, I've got a ball here, I've got a little tennis ball here. And what you want to have students do, I've got a little beat. I've got a clavinova here so it gives a nice beat. But you know, down, beat, bump, bump, bump. You can feel both parts of that beat. So down, up, down. That's a little fast for people to feel. But having them bounce a ball and feeling the down and the up, the down, up. That's what beats are all about. So in order for my students to really understand that, I wanted to give some kind of tactile tool. So I have, okay, I have a confession. My husband and I are totally into craft brew, uh, craft home brewed beer, okay? It's called craft beer. And they come in usually six packs and they're held together by something like this. So these little plastic can carriers are what they're called. Well, now I've collected so many of these and I look at those and I think, I have to do something with those. I love to repurpose things and make manipulatives out of things I already have in the house. So I cut them up and I made little um, labels to put in them. And this is my explanation of what beats are like. Beats actually have two parts. They have the on and then they have the off part. So that's why your teachers usually want you to say one and. So you feel both parts of the beat. And I think that's really important because so many of us, you know, say, okay, we got to count out loud and all that kind of stuff, but they really don't know what they're counting. Well, you're counting beats and you're counting the on part of the beat and the off part of the beat. So now I'm going to share my camera in a little bit different way so that you can see how I do this and I've been at my, all of my students in person have their own set of these so I'm just having them set them on the keyboard like this <clears throat> and I've got four right there and then they also have some lids now okay like I say I collect a lot of things I took juice plus bins for a long time so I had all these lids that were the same size and same color and so I had all my students put the lids on the numbers and then I asked them to play the lids and I put this rhythm back on and they could just play one pitch I'm not trying to get really creative here but just playing one pitch so and it was interesting at first they were doing this What about the offbeat? And then they're, oh yes, that's right. So once I knew that they could feel that offbeat, then I had them change some things around. So I had every, them move the lid over there. And I said, well, what would that sound like? And then it was interesting. Some of them did this. Okay, they were off. And I said, well, wait a minute, let's listen again. And then I noticed a lot of them were, were doing this. They just wanted to, Feel it first and point and help themselves track and then they played it. Then I had them move the lid again and I had them move over to here. And then they had to think about it a little bit. But most of them did it correctly the very first time. They did get tripped up by this one. Uh, some of them did this. Ooh, and then they missed three and four. But most of them got that. And then we started talking about, well, what is that rhythm right there? And next week in my studio, we are going to be doing the same thing, but we're going to be notating. I did not bother having them notate any of these rhythms using quarter notes, dotted quarter notes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I know you may speak a little bit different language than I do, but I think you understand what I mean by that. But what I did do is I wanted to talk about dotted notes just a little bit more. So I went back to the plain old quarter note and I asked them to think about, well, now we know that a quarter note is really one beat, but remember it has two parts. So when we divide a quarter note into two parts, what do we get? We get two eighth notes. So 
So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here so you can just see me. And I did this with students online as well. So I would just hold this up. We got a quarter note. All right, so when we divide a quarter note into two parts, we get two eighth notes like this. Oh, there we go. Now, then I said, but when we take a quarter note and we add a dot to it, now, what happened over here, and I have them look at their lids again, how many, one, we had the one and two, how many is that? That is three. So really what we did with this, this quarter note when we add the dot to it is we turned that quarter note into three parts. So we had one, two, and three. And that's what a dotted quarter note is. It's three eighth notes. So when you see a dot, think three. And I had never thought of seeing a dot and thinking three. Most of us say, okay, well, a dot means to take the note value plus half of itself, and it's one and a half beats. But that doesn't always connect, especially when we ask students to think about uh, eighth notes and uh, dotted eighth notes, all that kind of stuff. And yes, I did have them transfer that learning to how would you, what's a dotted half note mean then? What does a dotted eighth note mean? And it all made sense to them because they knew that when a dot is added to a note, it means three. You divide the note into three instead of just two. And then the other thing I really wanted to hit home is in, and I said this now, it's in most time signatures. I wasn't even really talking about time signatures, but in general, when you see a dot by a note, there's usually one little guy left over where there's usually this little companion who's left out. And so I wanted to make sure that they knew what kind of note was going to follow the, uh, the dotted quarter note. One more eighth note, he got left out. So same thing with quizzing them on a dotted half note. What's usually gonna follow is one quarter note. And I even have back here, I don't know if you can see it or not, before they go out the door, I wrote out some different note values and I had a little question mark. So I have a dotted half note and then there's a question mark. So I want them to tell me what kind of note is usually gonna follow that dotted half note. And they say, oh, a quarter note. And then I've got a dotted quarter note. What note is usually gonna follow that dotted quarter note? It's just reinforcing what I talked about at the beginning of the lesson, making those connections, keeping that common thread going so that then when they walk out the door, okay, print, they may forget, but guess what? I'm gonna go here again next time with these lids and um, can carriers again. And this time we're gonna notate some rhythms with them. And we'll do some ear training as well, where I may play a rhythm and then they'll have to display it on the lids and the can carriers so that we're making those connections and reinforcing what we talked about the week before. But the big takeaway about dotted notes is three. Think in threes. And a lot of students really connected with that. Even and a good deal of my older students too, like, oh yes, that makes it so much easier. So I hope that helps your students as well. All right, so kind of took a little pause there, but let me go on to, oh, I better share my screen again though, right? So let me do that. I'll go back to my slides here. And on to my theme. So as I already talked about, my theme for, I don't know, until I get tired of it, is rhythm. We're focusing on rhythm. And it doesn't mean that we don't talk about pitch and we don't talk about uh, chords or intervals, but I need a theme to help myself stay organized. You know, sometimes I think, uh, teachers like themes because it makes it more fun for the students. And I agree, it does make it more fun, but I make my themes based on what I want to cover and what I feel like are gaps in my students learning that I really want to focus on. So first of all, when you streamline your, pl streamline your plans, you can choose the concepts that you want to really focus on. You can narrow the so scope, and then you want to make sure that you sequence it. And an idea for that would be, you know, the grand staff, I like to give landmarks to my students that they memorize, and I like to ha have them know names for each of those. Again, giving a handle to something that they can grasp. grasp. So I have middle C, treble G, face C, they don't even know why it's called face C, but I just call it face C, outer space G, and cloud C. But if they have names for those, and then they can connect notes to those different landmarks. It's just going to help them learn things that much faster. So when I'm going to drill note names or pitch names, I'm going to narrow that scope or sequence. So I'm, I might just have them just drill those landmark notes first. 
I feel like sometimes, you know, at apps especially, they just throw the whole treble clef at students and then they're supposed to just figure it all out. You want to narrow down the quizzes as much as possible and then add in more until they feel comfortable with seeing all the notes of the treble clef. They're just not going to be ready to handle all of you know, recognizing all of them right away. Then the next thing is you want to have common threads in your lesson. So again, once I discuss dotted notes with my students at the beginning of the lesson, oh my goodness, we were on hyper alert for any dotted notes in their repertoire. And when we came to them, we talked about it again. Ooh, that is a dotted eighth note. What does that mean? Oh, three sixteenth notes. And oh, is there one left over? Yes. And then now some of them ran into pieces that were in six eight time. Well, there's a dotted quarter note. Is it followed by a lonely little eighth note? No, because it's a different time signature. And that's where we can start talking, you know, in depth about time signatures. And then we want to reinforce. That's what themes are good for. You, uh, we can add little mini quizzes all the time, like I was talking about when they go out the door, just asking them one more thing that they learned that hopefully will solidify their learning. And science says that little mini quizzes throughout what classes or lessons can really help. And then control. You know that we all like control. And so this is where I think it's really important to step back and think about this is their lesson. Remember, they're not taking lessons. We're, we, we may be giving lessons, but we want to give them the gift of music. So let, let's think of it a little bit differently and let them lead the way in some ways. So you can do this by I like Sally's uh, keyboard kickoff. I use the word kickoff here, but we can give them voice and choice. That's what we want to provide our students. Let them have a say in what goes on in their lessons and what they're learning. And here's how you can do that and make them feel like they have ownership in their lessons, but secretly you're doing a lot behind the scenes to guide them. So first of all, invite students to choose the agenda, meaning, I love it when students come in and they can't wait to play something for me like, okay, let's start there. Because the minute you say, I want to hear that sonata page two, they may not have practiced that and then you've just put them in the hot seat and they're like panicking. Oh my goodness, I didn't work on that, but I did work on this. You want to start the lesson off in a kinder, gentler way and you want them, you want to be happy and show Basically, you want to show that you're happy that they're at the lesson and you want to find out what they're proud of and what they've taken ownership in. And then along the way, when they've got those parts that they didn't practice, that's when you can help them and, and boost their confidence so that they want to play that piece first for you next time. And then repertoire. Provide a selection from which to choose. I think this is so important. Even if you want them to play something from the Baroque period, let uh, give them some options. Play a couple of different pieces and let them decide which one is their favorite. It's still meeting your specifications of what you want to accomplish in the lesson, but it's giving them some voice and some choice. And then, like I said, practice. Let your students self-diagnose their trouble spots and then let them prescribe their own practice strategies. It's a great way for them to take ownership. And hey, if that practice strategy didn't work, then they can certainly try another one. But letting them you know, take the reins over some of the lesson, control over some of that, will help you connect with your students as well and bring them ultimately to that end of meeting their goals. Now, one thing I, I forgot to mention that I really wanted to mention, so I'm going to do this here just a second. I'm going to, uh, let's see, I'm going to stop my screen and then I'll go back to my screen in just a second. One of the things that I decided to start at the beginning of my lessons for fall was a rhythm theme, but also a theme of 20th century music. And I have an off bench component with my lessons. Students come with me and sit with me at the bench for 30 minutes, and then they spend another 30 minutes off the bench. So I've got it set up over there. I've got another sneeze guard. I clean everything off, but I got an iPad and they usually do something on the iPad. And I wanted them to learn about the time period of the 20th century and the different styles. And there are some great podcasts called Classics for Kids. They're about six minutes long, each of the little episodes, and they dive into different 
the, the lives of different composers. So I've been talking, I've been having my students listen to podcasts about Scott Joplin. We're going into George Gershwin next, then we're going into Aaron, Aaron Copeland and the Beatles. Now, uh, maybe I'm just being a little bit partial to some of the American composers, but I also have a whole bunch of Russian composers in there because, of course, that's, those are not the only people who can compose music in the 20th century. There's so many. But Classics for Kids is an amazing resource for your students to learn about these composers. But what I found is that I, it was hard for me to design something so that students could go from one podcast to the next to the next. So I created, they're called 20th century flashbacks. And um, I can share a slide if you would like me to in a little bit and I can show you and walk you around uh, the slide with you just a little bit. But basically it invites students to click on a number and then that takes them over to the podcast at Classics for Kids. But the reason why I bring it up is I wanted my students to then record what they're learning from those podcasts on what I call a one-page report. Now, I'm stealing this from some educational podcasts that I follow. And what's really neat about a one-page report is there's room for students to write down the facts that they learn, but also there's room for them to doodle. And studies show that doodling helps you focus and listen more. So what you're seeing right here are templates that I made for my students. They, they can choose which one they want. I've got squares, I've got circles, I've got all different kinds of things. And then they're just writing down some important facts that they learned from the podcast. And I like this one in particular. You can I don't know if you can see that, but there's a little um, calendar because nobody knows when Scott Joplin was actually born. And I think every student wrote that down as a piece of information. It was just fa fascinating. And now I can also share these slides with my students who are... Uh, taking online lessons and so I have Ethan who is uh, homeschooled and his mommy is a good little homeschooler mommy and he wrote up this nice little report about Scott Joplin and it's just cute how he uh, opened up his his opening paragraph have you ever heard the song the entertainer I bet if I hummed a few lines you would recognize it <laughs> and he just talks about Scott Joplin and it was just so fun to read his report so uh, that's how I'm trying to incorporate some of that history for my students so that they can see where these composers came from. And most of these composers, it's amazing, number one, a lot of them are from Russia who moved over to the States and then most of them did not take piano lessons and wish they would have or could have, but learned piano on their own. So it's quite an, an adventure and story for my students to learn what students from long ago did back in those days. All right, so I've got just a little bit more and then I'll pass it along. I'll just finish up here. So voice and choice was the last thing that you can think about. Well, there's many more ways that you could think about, but connecting with your students. So I'm just going to close with begin with the end. Think about what you want your students to accomplish in a lesson, to accomplish in a year of lessons, and let them walk alongside you as you make those decisions and begin with the end of a lesson. Think about what you're doing in a lesson and equip your students with those practice skills so they're excited to go home between uh, lessons. I call it the black hole because it is really scary. We don't know what they're going to do when they get home, but we can, we can control some of that. And so I, I end with just find me at lelavis.com. And if you're interested in some of my quirky ideas, I do have a number of resources. And there, I've got a nice little coupon for you, Curious20, that will give you 20% off anything that you might find there. And thank you, Sally, for mentioning my podcast and finding me on that. I just started a podcast. It was kind of a, a, a deep dive into something that I wasn't didn't know if I was going to like or not, but I've really enjoyed um, taking that dive into podcasting. So I'd love for you to follow me there. And I will stop sharing my screen and hand it back over to you. Wow. Wow, Lila, you know, just full. <laughs> so many different ideas coming out of there. I know there's been lots and lots of feedback from people saying, loving the ideas, loving the ideas. Um, and a few people have had to go. But, uh, uh, I, and I, I wrote down something that you said, we want to give students the gift of music and I think your students are, are clearly getting the gift of music from you so I you know I, I think they're incredibly fortunate to have all that the, all those I, creative ideas that you're you, you've shared with us so generously today um, 
So super, super, super stuff. Sharon. Really, really wonderful. Yeah, just following through from the comments here, um, and I'm with Elaine on saying, yeah, that doodling bit. And I mean, what a wonderful way of, you know, we're talking about ownership. How do we get them to take ownership? Because sometimes that can be the big question. Mm. So how do we actually do that? I mean, that is one really, I mean, we can all see how super simple it is. Um, you give them a template and you let them doodle and take ownership and go and go off and discover. Um, and that leads to just such meaningful learning because it's 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 theirs. I mean, I, I love the way that you've been reinforcing the importance of, um, you know, us letting go of that control so that they can um, can can take over. Um, we, we've got a question from Nina um, as to give suggestions for what to use in online lessons for a beat if you don't have um, a clavinova or a digital piano. I mean, I've got some ideas of what I do, but Leela? Well, I'd love to hear yours, Sally, because I know <laughs> I think that is one of the hardest things. Uh, one app that I recommend to my students is Super Metronome Groovebox, which I can I can grab my iPad in just a minute too. But it's not just your metronome; it is a souped-up metronome with a whole bunch of different styles and groove. And so I, I can have my students turn that on on their side, and then yeah. they can show me how they're playing along with something as well. Yeah. So yes, good question. Yeah. yeah, I I've been doing that. I've been doing it this week actually, and. Um, I share my sound from my computer and I, I just have my Spotify account open mm -hmm. and I've got various pieces in there that are in my beginner's piano kind of favourites thing. Um, and things like, you know, from the classical um, uh, way of things, things like the Radetzky March. And I haven't got any cups with me at the moment, but um, we've been using kind of cups, you know, and doodle doodle that's it that those doodle 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 and they've been marching their cups along or their toys or whatever um via that um so i think that's that to me seemed to work nina yeah and the other thing i'm just going to pull out is for those of you <laughs> who don't know that Sally has a new book, new couple of books ready to play. And I mean, I, I loved Leela what you were using, the, the tennis ball. Um, I mean, that's such a wonderful thing to, to help students feel the beat. And I mean, one of the things that um, I've been doing recently is, I mean, there are any number of songs and rhymes, you know, there's cobbler, cobbler, there's jelly on a plate, um, there's no robbers like today, there's hey, hey, all of these and get them to actually sing the song or say the rhyme whilst they are, um, you know, feeling the beat by doing any number of those things, bouncing a, a tennis ball. Um, so that's, that, that's, that's another idea, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> using using body rhythm mm -hmm. body yeah. body percussion is body great percussion. for for feeling that beat yeah mm -hmm. really really good ah oh, so Ooh. okay alina has asked <laughs> yes can you say what your podcast for children is called again yes it's classics for kids and they man they it's prolific. They've got pretty much every composer that you can imagine within the classical realm. And what's so nice about them is they're about six minutes long. And some of my high school students, they have limited off bench time with me. And sometimes I go into their off bench time and they don't have time to sit down and listen. I have texted them the exact podcast that I want to, for them to listen to. And they have all come back like, that was so good. I really like that. So even though it says classics for kids, they're not childish at all and i enjoy them too yeah no i shall i shall certainly be going and looking those those out and i and i love the simplicity of the one page report um there was you know just really really simple that the the child can make their own um and you're obviously getting some some lovely res uh, um results with it through uh what the children are sharing with you um the other thing that i oh, there's, loads of stuff I thought oh yeah write that down write that down write that down Leela um this idea of having a theme for yourself and this is something I do now I have a theme a concept whether it's rhythm or working on yeah landmark notes or you know 
not looking at their not looking at the keyboard the whole time which <laughs> they can so easily do and you i i find because otherwise if you try and have something different for every single child i mean obviously it's bespoke to every child but an overarching theme within your studio for yourself just simplifies things is that what what you find oh yes because i was overwhelmed all the time well now oh well, everybody really should get to know their rhythms better and you know what, and, and, and then, oh, we got to do chords and oh, we so I just thought, you know what, no, we're just going to spend some time on rhythm yeah. and regardless if Aiden, who's a senior in high school, who gets every piece of rhythm, like he can read anything to mm -hmm. my little beginner Addison, we, I'm doing these, these things yeah. with them. And yeah. I don't care if a a Aiden already knows that he probably didn't think about dividing up a dotted note into three, you know, so there's something that anybody can take away from and and i think that's really good for us as teachers as well because a we create the resources and we get better quality resources because we're not trying to create 29 different sets of resources so you know we we focus on one and also we get to refine our ideas and our teaching don't we you know what you try it with one person well, that kind of works so you try it with a second person with some changes and and i love it when that happens and the ideas develop as you as you go through your your students really fun really fun and i use these with adults too and none of my adults think that i'm being silly and they all appreciate it i think adults sometimes have a harder time grabbing on to things especially rhythm oh my goodness yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a whole yeah. other thing <laughs> yeah and, well it is and yet you know rhythm is so fundamental rhythm is the flow of the music and without without rhythm we start with rhythm really i think we start with rhythm mm -hmm. we're getting lots and lots of positive things in aren't we and we i think it's nearly time to finish to be honest but um many so many great ideas uh says diana i'm just going to go back many thanks somebody's off to work adrian's off to work mm -hmm. and um yeah, Elaine says she's got to go and teach, but thank you so much to all of you for an inspiring hour. I don't think we really did very much, did we, Sharon? Um, <laughs> <We're not. laughs> we just went mute. <laughs> you got me up at seven o'clock on a Thursday morning, so you did something, right? Yeah. <laughs> a little something, yeah, a little something. Um, fantastic, much appreciated. Such a great webinar, uh, says Annette. And um, Wendy says, thank you for loads of practical ideas. Um, uh, just just wonderful absolutely wonderful uh leela uh, all the ideas that you've shared with us so uh you know thank you for taking up our invitation and um hopefully you'll be back and doing another one with us. i think that definitely yeah. is <laughs> well you can join me on a podcast someday <gasps> oh <That would> be <laughs> <exciting>. <laughs> okay so wonderful. Sharon, over well, to you I just want to say a massive thank you to everyone who has joined us. Um, we've actually had um, quite a, a huge percentage who have registered have also been able to join us live. So thank you so much um, for spending the hour with us. And again, just to say, Leela, thank you so, so much for getting up early to be with us this morning. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks so for having me. Been fun. Thank you. Yeah. So the replay, bye bye. we will be getting that. Um, we'll be emailing it out to everyone who's registered um, later on this evening. And yeah, I think a lot of people are heading off to teach. So hey, you've got lots of ideas to get going with. So enjoy teaching. Have a great day. Bye. Bye bye.